So today we're going to be doing uh, a new set of phase diagrams. So were you, kind of give me an idea with your facial expressions, you don't have to raise your hand or anything. Were you okay with the PT diagram and the, and the PV diagram, you know? You, you could figure out your way around it, you know, if it's a high pressure, or high volume, or PT diagram, your, your boiling points and so on are, are indicated by the vapor liquid equilibrium. Well, it gets kind of crazy now when we start mixing. We're going to be dealing with binary mixtures. And so I hope you understood the PV and PT. This is when you start to get that brain cramp. You start looking at some of these phase diagrams, and you've just <clears throat> got to go to the axes repeatedly and say, oh, what's being plotted? So we'll do that. I'll try to emphasize the, the basic principles for understanding these phase diagrams, and we'll dive in. So you shouldn't be intimidated by them. but. This may be the place, if you start to say, oh, I'm not sure if I get this, that's okay, raise your hand and, and ask a question. Let's start with mixing. We're going to make mixtures. <clears throat> and so we're going to take two substances that mix spontaneously. We're going to start with the easy case, you know, things like acetone and water, things that are miscible at all concentrations. So you can put any combination of acetone and water from 1% to 99% and it's all one phase. Uh, naturally, we're going to go a couple more lectures after spring break and talk about partially miscible solutions where we get phase separation. So oil and water, water octanol, those kinds of situations where you have two <coughs> layers, they also have phase diagrams for those. <coughs> so the one model, this isn't the only model, but it's one I teach because we talk about the Hansen solubility parameters later in the semester. And this is the model for the delta H of mixing. <coughs> And we talk about ideal solutions. So one definition of an ideal solution is that when you mix the molecules, there's no enthalpy change. So the, the intermolecular attractions you had to pull apart for substance A, and the, the molecular attractions you had to pull apart for substance B, because that's essentially what mixing is. If you think about it, look at my hands. I've got my fingertips. These are the molecules. I pull A apart. I pull B apart. That raises the energy. Then I mix A and B and condense it, and I get energy back. The difference between those two is delta H. So it takes energy to pull the molecules apart, again, from each other, and then you get energy back by mixing them. And an ideal solution says the energy you get back is exactly what it costs to pull them apart. So you separate the molecules, mix them, and recondense, and it's the same energy. That's an ideal solution. It doesn't mean that the intermolecular attractions are zero. It just means that acetone likes acetone just as much as acetone likes water. Okay. And if that's an ideal solution, then water has no more preference for water than it does for acetone. And so they mix together. And I like to think of this as a jar of red marbles and blue marbles. There's no difference between the red and red interactions and the red and blue interactions. And if you mix that together, there's no heat given off, it doesn't get cold, it's not endothermic, it's not exothermic, it's energetically neutral in terms of enthalpy. But entropy drives the mixing. Because if you have a jar of two different colored marbles and you just start rolling it around, you look down and eventually you're going to see all the reds and blues are mixed together. And that's straight up entropy. You can even calculate that with marbles and with molecules. Because what's going on with that red patch of marbles at the top and the blue patch of marbles at the bottom? They start out with a volume this much, and then they expand to a volume that much. That's entropically beneficial, right? The box has increased, the number of energy levels has moved down, there's more statistics. So even in a macroscopic case, you can calculate the entropy change, because you can even clearly see a volume change. So <clears throat> that would be an ideal solution, where the enthalpy of mixing is zero. Uh, you can use the Hansen solubility parameters to calculate the, the delta H for what they call regular solutions or non-ideal solutions. And so they said, we'll get to what those delta T's mean. And those are molar volumes and those are mole fractions. So X1, X2 are mole fractions. V1 and V2 are mole, uh, molar, molar volumes. And then those deltas are the Hansen solubility parameters. We're not there yet, so let's just stick with the ideal case. So in, no intermolecular attraction differences on mixing. So 
so if you think about this uh, change in, in Gibbs energy with respect to temperature, uh, if you look at the equation, let me find it here. So the change in Gibbs energy mixing with respect to temperature, there's no temperature, uh, you know, H is by itself. And so there's, there's no change in Gibbs energy with respect to temperature using H, but there is for S. So if you'll notice that the, uh, the derivative of the Gibbs energy mixing with respect to temperature is just minus the delta S. And the entropy of mixing is shown here. It's minus NR, the sum of all of the different components that you have and their mole fractions. So this equation just drops out of the sky here in our notes, but you can go to the book and look up the derivation. But one thing I want to point out is that all of these mole fractions are less than one because it's the number of moles of substance I divided by the total number of moles. And so even in the highest case, there'd be one, but then you just have a single substance. Okay. So all of these, if you have a mixture, you've got uh, fractions. The um, mole fraction is less than one. And so then you're dealing with a natural log of something that's less than one. And so all of these natural logs are, are negative. And so they cancel this negative sign here. So all of the entropies of mixing are positive. So the only thing that stops substances from mixing, this is the principle I'm trying to point out here in this slide, the thing that stops substances from mixing is enthalpy. Entropy always favors mixing. And so if you could overcome the energetic penalty of taking apart the substances when you mix them, um, if you don't get that energy back plus some, then you're going to have phase separation. So when oil and water don't mix, it's because water likes water so much. Water's hydrogen bonding with, that, with itself. And so if there's oil in the way, it's going to push it out of the way and snap together with other water molecules. So in other words, if you had to pull the water apart, there would be an enormous penalty. So pulling water apart would give you this you know, enormous penalty. And so now we have vapor. And you pull oil apart, there's really not that many intermolecular attractions. So you get this much you know, penalty. And then you mix them, OK? And it comes to somewhere here, which is above where you were at the beginning. And so it's a positive delta H. And that overwhelms the benefit of the entropy term. And so even though you might have an entropic benefit of mixing oil and water, energetically, it's uphill. And so it doesn't mix. And so this ends up being, because the enthalpy is zero for a regular solution, this ends up being the Gibbs energy of mixing. It's just based on those mole fractions. And so let's think about this now, these, um, these Gibbs energies. Uh, you'll see mu throughout the book and in, in other texts, and they talk about chemical potential. The chemical potential is just the, the molar Gibbs Free energy. And so you've got the same chemical potential when you're at equilibrium, the gas phase and the liquid phase, because they're at equilibrium, they have the same uh, chemical potential. There's no change in delta G going from vapor to, to liquid. And that applies to each component too. And even for non-ideal solutions, actually. And so let's begin before we get into the the phase diagrams, let's focus on these essential terms. So this right here, if you're starting to drift, focus on this one. This will explain, I found later, this, I didn't ever start with this, but I found out later that students were confused between Z and Y and X. And if you get those confused, you are lost in these diagrams. So whenever we deal with a mole fraction and we use that, that letter X, X sub A is the the mole fraction of A in the liquid phase. So it's really clear that you associate X with liquid and Y with gas. And then ZA would be the total in a container. So if you have a container that's sealed and it's all at equilibrium between the, the liquid and the gas, you might have, and we'll see an example where ZA is the total mole fraction, but it's been split into vapor and liquid. So the, the liquid will be XA, the vapor will be YA, but Z will be somewhere in the middle. So if you were to combine the, the weighted average of the gas molecules and the, and the liquid molecules and their mole fractions, 
you would get the Z A. You would get the overall mole fraction. So use this as a key. If you ever get confused, come back to this slide and, and you'll straighten things out. So let's look at our first phase diagram for a mixture. Begin with the axes. So the x-axis is the mole fraction of substance A. There's two things on that axis. We're plotting mole fraction of substance A, so it goes from 0 to 1. But implied in that is also the mole fraction of B. So if, if the mole fraction of A is 0, then it's pure B. So that would be mole fraction of B was 1. So you, could, you don't have to draw this on there, but you could also say this is 1 for XB and 0. So that's your first stop if you arrive here in town on this phase diagram. Your first stop is the x-axis. <laughs> is it A or B that's being plotted? And it's mole fraction of something, mole fraction of A on this plot. Sometimes you'll see that it's mole fraction of B. Sometimes you label the substance mole fraction of water or mole fraction of alcohol. And so you want to make sure that you go to the x-axis first, let, you know, inform yourself on what's being plotted. Then go to the y-axis and see, are we plotting, which, which state variable are we plotting? In this case, it's pressure. You could also plot temperature. I don't ever remember seeing a, a, a volume based diagram. It's either pressure and temperature. At least in this course, those are the only two that we're going to deal with. We're going to focus on pressure today, but then mostly we're going to use the temperature plots. So, mostly because the, um, the pressure plots uh, are at a given temperature, whereas the temperature plots are, are at a given pressure. And a lot of times we just use the one atmosphere pressure and we have a temperature X, a TX phase diagram. This is a PX phase diagram. So this is at a particular temperature. So this might be the room temperature phase diagram for this mixture. <clears throat> yes? Uh, in these equations, what is the asterisk that's in for? Um, that's just... A, uh, standing for the, the what they call the saturation vapor pressure or the vapor pressure of the pure substance. And so you notice where the, the asterisks are. They're on either end of the phase diagram. So that's a good thing to do next. So if we come over here at XA, so here was the mole fraction of A. We come all the way to the right. So this one indicates it's pure A. So because that's pure A, this would be the vapor pressure of pure A. And that's what the asterisk means. And sometimes you see P sat A. Saturation, yeah, they're saying it's the saturation vapor pressure, meaning it's all A. Uh, why they use the word saturation, I don't know. So, so star, that, that works the same. Yes? Since you haven't seen the volume uh, diagram, maybe because like, when you mix two things together, sometimes volume actually just changes. Well, this would be the volume of the container because we've got vapor and liquid in there as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then over here on the left would be the saturation vapor pressure of B. So if we're over here, we have zero A in the container. We have 100% B, and so that's the vapor pressure of B at this temperature. So like I said, if this is room temperature, then this is less than one atmosphere vapor pressure. If this is room temperature for A, this is greater than one atmosphere. So that's one and a half atmospheres is the vapor pressure of that substance at room temperature. So this would be something that has a boiling point less than, less than uh, room temperature. So we have some substances like that. There's a solvent that I have called uh, solstice, and it has a 19 degree vapor pressure. And so I would have to put it in a pressurized container for it to come to uh, equilibrium. You know, and, and in that tank, you know, it would tell me that tank, if at room temperature, that tank might have, say, one and a half atmospheres pressure in it. Because it's pure solstice. Now, we have two ways to understand this or, or to describe this diagram. We have Routes Law here. And so let's look at these Routes Law lines. I've drawn the equation on here. So this is a very simple model. You're going from zero vapor pressure because you don't have any molecules of A. <laughs> How can there be a partial pressure of A if there's no A in the container? And then up here you have the pure 
vapor pressure of pure A. And if you just say it's linear, well, you just take this number, multiply by the, the mole fraction. Mole fraction goes from zero to one linearly. And so then that takes the pressure from zero up to the saturation vapor pressure. So that's Ralph's law, it's totally simple. I mean, it, you know, it's just mole fraction times that saturation vapor pressure. Can you normally see that being a linear trend for almost all masses? Um, we're dealing with the vapor pressure, so it's the va it's the pressure of the vapor above a liquid. Oh, okay. Yeah, and so that's another thing. So we're thinking about the phase diagrams, and these would be the vapor pressures above the liquids. So we have in our container two substances mixed together, something like acetone and water, and this would be the higher pressure, so this would be the one with acetone's more volatile than water. I mean, you know that just because you can smell it, right? It's, more, it's giving you a lot more vapor than water does at room temperature. So this A would be acetone in this case, and this would be, if we were a 50-50 mixture, this would tell us that acetone's vapor pressure is half of what it would be, because it's only half the substance that's in the, in the solution. And then water might be this vapor pressure at pure water, but half, you know, 50-50 mixture, this would be the vapor pressure of pure water. So that's Routes law, and that tells us the partial pressures of each of those. And then Dalton's law applies in all of these cases. So you just take the partial pressures and add them together to get the total. And so this dot plus this dot equals this dot. It's kind of a sideways equation. So that would be Dalton's law. PA plus CB equals P total. And you could do that along all of these places and these lines and you would get this straight line which is Dalton's law connecting the two vapor pressures. So this would be the ideal case and this would be molecules that are compatible with each other that they like each other just as much as they like themselves so there's really no difference in mixing them. The red and blue marble example. Okay. And so this is the simplest PX diagram you'll ever see. Now, one thing is, it is at a given temperature. So if you change the temperature, then the lines move. Because these are the vapor pressures of the pure substances at a given temperature. So that's shown on the next slide. So this might be at 298, or 280, or 270. I've drawn three lines here. The nice thing about this is, here's one atmosphere, OK? So that's one atmosphere right there. And so these, these would be boiling right here in our experience, our everyday experience. So this would be the, the normal boiling point for substance A. Just this one because it's at one atmosphere. So one atmosphere, pure A is normal boiling point. And that would be at 270 at Kelvin. But what about those other two lines? They cross one atmosphere at different places. And so this mixture, let's say, what, what would you estimate that to be? This is 50, so 0 0.5. That's 0.75. Um, <clears throat> Point, six. Say point 0.6. Okay, so um, <clears throat> XA equals 0 0.6 boils at 280. Okay, so you can use this phase diagram to tell you boiling points. You've got one atmosphere, and when the pre vapor pressure of the liquid equals one atmosphere, you could see that it sustains bubbles and it's boiling. Okay. And so it would boil at 280 if it was 0.6 uh, mole fraction of A. If it was this one, say so what is that, 0 0.25, 0 0.3? Yeah, so 0.3. XA equals 0.3. Boils at 298. 
So that's what you can get from these kinds of plots. This is one example. You've got one atmosphere line. You can say, okay, I've got the boiling points of these different mixtures. <clears throat> now notice how they change with vapor pressures. Well, we know the temperature dependence of those vapor pressures. We could get these from the, C the Antoine equation. or the clausius clapeyron equation. So those, the temperature dependence of those vapor pressures for the pure substances, we can, we can model. If we know the delta H of vaporization, we could use the clausius clapeyron equation. If we knew the A, B, and C constants from the CRC, we could use the Antoine equation. So we know where those saturation vapor pressure lines go. And so then if we know those endpoints, we can draw Routes law line across and predict the boiling points of all the mixtures. So if we had a mixture, we would know its boiling point. If we measured the boiling point, we could estimate what the mixture was. So that's one of the uses of these phase diagrams. Pretty slick. Before we move on, just anything that you'd like clarified. Okay. Now, this one is where your brain starts to go, why? What? Okay. <clears throat> These black lines that we've drawn are the, the XA lines. These are the compositions of the, <clears throat> the liquid phase. But what comes off the surface of that liquid may be rich in the more volatile components. Right? Because if something has a higher vapor pressure, it's going to come off preferentially. If you boil acetone in water and you sniff with an instrument the top, it's going to be rich in acetone. Does that make sense? Because acetone has a higher vapor pressure. What does rich in acetone mean? It means it's got a different curve on this x-axis. So this red line is the composition of the gas phase. The red line is the composition of the gas phase. You see the YA? It's the P total <clears throat> plotted versus YA. Now our, our X axis goes from zero to one and XA and YA are both fractions. And so we could plot P total and instead of drawing that mark where XA is, we could draw that mark where YA is and we get the red line. So this is our, our definition of the Y a composition, it's the pressure of A divided by the pressure total. The pressure A given by Routes law. And then the pressure total using Dalton's law, we have the pressure B, so it starts here. What's the equation for this line? It's this B here, and then <clears throat> it's plotted by XA. What's, what's the rest of this business? Well, it's PA to minus PB, so it's this difference here, that's the rise over the run times XA. So that's the slope times XA, and that gives us this P total curve. And so you take the Routes law divided by this Dalton's law interpolation and you get YA. And now if you plot P total versus YA, you get this red curve here. So what this means is if we take a 50-50 mixture and we boil it, okay, that's going to be the vapor pressure and the composition of the gas phase at that same pressure is right there. Notice we've come horizontally across. We've come horizontally because we're at that boiling pressure, you know, and say we have to, you know, we're at 50-50, so we've got to raise the, you know, um, actually, actually, the, let me, let me raise this, let me back this up, because I want to talk about actual boiling. So this is where it would boil. So I would say, a, we said a 30 would boil at, uh, at one atmosphere and room temperature, and, and it would, this would be the vapor composition above the boiling liquid. 
And so that's interesting. We have a liquid that's 30% A, and we boil it, and what's the vapor composition in A? It's 50%. This is how you distill liquids. Because distillation separates things based on their boiling points. And it's using this com competitive difference between the liquid composition and the vapor composition. If those were the same, you couldn't separate them with, with distillation. But in ideal solutions, you can separate things based upon their different vapor pressures and their different compositions in the vapor phase. And we'll make sure that I go slow so that you guys can ask questions. You pick any one of these combinations. Let's say we take this one all the way up to here. Okay. This would be the vapor pressure at that. Well, this would be the vapor, the vapor composition at that pressure. In fact, you could kind of look at this as a real phase diagram, because that's what it is. If I'm up here in terms of pressure, what do I have? It's too high for the vapor to exist, so it's all liquid. If I come down here, I've got vapor-liquid equilibrium. So in this region, I have two phases. If I get down here, Essentially, I've got too low a pressure. The liquid doesn't exist. It's all vapor. And so only in those middle regions do I have two phases. So I've got a vapor-liquid equilibrium region when you have that split between XA and YA. So up here, one phase, all liquid. And down here, vapor. Now, how do I know liquid's on top? The vapor's on bottom. This is where the axes are important. It's the pressure. Pressure, yes. A higher pressure, liquid. Lower pressure, vapor. Just think about pulling a vacuum on something. You're pulling the pressure way down. It's all going to go to vapor. When we go to a TX diagram, high temperature, vapor, low temperature, liquid. So vapor and liquid will flip when we go to the temperature diagram. But in, So you always got to focus on those axes if you if you think vapors on top or vapors on bottom you are wrong you have to look at the axis and know how vapor and liquid behave with pressure and how vapor and liquid behave with temperature so i'm just trying to give you stable places to stand right if you if you find the, the y-axis then you can take a step okay then i know that's vapor and i know that's liquid if you find you're on a temperature diagram you say okay i know now that's vapor and that's liquid so you know don't don't just jump on a vapor spot because you didn't start with the y-axis and you'll fall through it's like, in my mind i'm seeing indiana jones with the little hebrew letters and he's got to <laughs> jump on those things those rocks okay so active imagination i just wanted you to come with me so okay so this is simple distillation and, and what we're talking about, using these differences in vapor pressure. Um, now, dissimilar liquids, we've been talking about ideal liquids, dissimilar liquids don't behave. <laughs> They're not ideal. So this would be carbon disulfide and acetone mixed together. So we've got Routes Law. These lines here are Routes Law. Okay, but look how non-ideal these are. These are sort of the these are the experimental mm -hmm. lines, and then Routes law plus Dalton's law would give us this line right here. And so that's pretty crazy, isn't it? Tell you what's really crazy about this diagram is, well, first of all, what's the x-axis? What what are we dealing with? Mole fraction of what on the x-axis? Carbon, Carbon disulfide. So we come all the way over here. And this is pure carbon disulfide, CS2, right here. Pure CS2. So this is the vapor pressure of pure CS2. And this is the vapor pressure of acetone. That's nice that we have numbers on here. So CS2 has a vapor pressure of, we'll say, 350. Okay. So if you were to measure the tank, 
pressure, you evacuated everything, let's say you freeze this mixture, you evacuate everything so there's no head space, and then you seal it up, you have your pressure gauge, and you let it warm up to whatever temperature this is at, and, and you measure the pressure. If it's pure CS2, that pressure would come up to 350 PSI, or no, tor, 350 tor, okay, or millimeters of mercury. If you had pure acetone in the container, that pressure would come up to 250, you see on the chart, pure acetone. So maybe, maybe 233. Okay. But if you had a 60-40 mixture of carbon disulfide and acetone, the pressure would be almost 450. That's so crazy, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The mixture has 100 more millimeters of mercury pressure than either of the pure substances. <laughs> That's nuts, isn't it? You would not predict that from Routh's Law and Dalton's Law. You would say, well, whatever the most high pressure one is, it's going to be less than that because I have a mixture. You know, I don't have the pure carbon disulfide, so the vapor pressure should be less than that. You would be wrong in this case. It would be 100 PSI higher than the pure vapor pressure of CS2. Why is that? What would this tell you about these two substances? They what? That's not true. I know. It's, it's <laughs> tempting. But, but we use the word react in a sloppy way. Not to be critical, but think about that. React's not the word you want to use. Right? Because there would be different compounds in the, in the container. So it's still CS2. It's still acetone. Um, don't be upset, I'm just saying. Yeah, react, react is a very particular word, meaning the chemical compositions have changed. What is another, um, what's that? Repel, they repel each other. Um, so that would be, yeah, they just don't like each other. There's energetically, the mixture is not favorable. So they have a higher vapor pressure because they don't like the mixture. They like each other much better than they like the other. Okay. And so this would be a, a volatile mixture, more volatile than the, than the two uh, pure substances. But and, and if you plotted out the pure substances, this would be the vapor pressure of carbon disulfide, and this would be the vapor pressure of acetone. Would this not mix kind of like oil and water? Or would it still be a bit of homogenous solution? Good question, but it's still a homogeneous solution in this case. So they, they, it is homogeneous all the way across, but um, we will see examples where they become partially miscible. Yeah. But we'll use those with the T. It's a TX phase diagram where we see those. So they're favorable, favorable enough to become you know, homogeneous, but yes. they still don't like each other. Yeah, so okay. they still, we know they don't like each other because of the higher vapor pressure Okay. for each of the substances. Yes. So, like Ashley was saying, when you mix two liquids, the total volume is not equal to the two volumes of the Yes, that's true. So you can plot the volume on these. I guess I have seen those, actually. They're called excess volume plots. And excess could be negative. So it just means a volume difference. Instead of just the volume being the, the connecting the partial, the molar volumes between the two pure substances, it'll be a funky curve, too. And so some substances, so what would you predict if they really hate each other, that the volume of the liquid, would it be higher than the ideal volume or lower than the ideal volume if they hate each other? Yeah, they'd, it, it wouldn't compact as densely. So they would be farther apart. And if you have something like ethanol in water, right at that, with the, this, we get to azeotropes later, but at the azeotropic mixture for ethanol and water, that's just the right, the sweet spot for the amount of water and ethanol together, and that's got a lower volume than you would predict. So the molecules, even in the liquid phase, are closer to each other, and it's more dense. Yeah. So let's look at these examples here, this, um, these individual vapor pressure lines. So if you look at acetone, hey, right here, Routh's Law applies, right? Even if for a little bit, and up here, I mean a really little bit for CS2, Routh's Law applies. So if I had this mixture here, it was 97% carbon disulfide with a little bit of acetone in it. How would you characterize that? Like if you were just to tell, I don't know, your 
brother or sister what you've got in this container. You know, they're, they're not chemistry majors, or maybe they are, but let's pretend they're not. Okay, what would you tell them? Would you get into the percentages of 2% acetone? Yeah. And, and what would you tell them? I've got a can of dirty CS2, yeah. <laughs> right? It's 97% carbon disulfide, and it's got a little bit of acetone in that. So it's just dirty carbon disulfide. It's not grossly dirty. It's only 2% uh, contaminated. But also over here, acetone. What would you tell them if you had, had this solution here? It's 95, 90, you know, 95% acetone. It's just dirty acetone. It's got 5% contamination in it. And so dirty solvents still follow Routh's law. That's the take home. Dirty solvents will still follow Routh's law in their vapor pressure. So the vapor pressure of, of acetone, if it's 95% acetone, is about 95% of its vapor pressure. So that's pretty cool. But the total pressure is much higher than that. And it's much higher than that because down here, the vapor pressure of carbon disulfide is much higher than it would be with Routh's law. So there's a huge deviation down here. And that adds up to this extra bump for the total vapor pressure. So the, the dirty solvents have their Routh's law vapor pressures, but the solutes uh, have to follow a different curve. And so that's what Henry's law is. So here's the difference between Henry's law and Routh's law. And you just focus on the limits. So on the dirty solvent side, that's Routh's law. And on the solute side, a really dilute solute, that that's Henry's law. And you can look up Henry's Law Constants, but it's a pain to tabulate Henry's Law Constants. Okay, because you're dealing with the solute. And so I've got, let's say this is the carbon disulfide curve. I've got carbon disulfide. I have a Henry's Law Constant for carbon disulfide and acetone, and it doesn't apply to any other liquid. Mm -hmm. So that's a crummy thing. It's not really a property of carbon disulfide. It's a property of carbon disulfide in a solvent. And so these tables, you may say, wow, that's a big Henry's Law table, but it's just infinite how big it could be. Yeah. It's that solute in every known solvent, and then the next solute in every known solvent. And it's just, you know, it'd be a pain to tabulate all of those. But you might get lucky and find for your mixture, <laughs> you have the Henry's Law constant and you have the Routh's Law. Routh's Law constant is just the va pure vapor pressure. Okay, so you can calculate those. But Henry's law constants can be difficult to find if you have a, a weird mixture. Like some of my mixtures with these fluorinated solvents, nobody's measured the Henry's law behavior for those solvents. So there's no way I could find out what the true vapor pressure of my fluorinated compound would be over the, the bulk solution. So. Well, you could do it in public. There you go. And, that, and that's the kind of thing. So, you know, if I wanted to do that kind of research, I'd set up the vapor vessel, you know, where I could measure the vapor pressures and maybe a spectroscopic probe so I could verify my concentrations. And then that would be what we call just a, a research machine where you turn the crank. You know, I've got the equipment and I put another mixture in there and publish another value, add to my table, you know, and you just get undergrads and grads and just turn the crank and paper, 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 paper. paper, paper. You know, I just never wanted to do that, but that's definitely something that could be done, especially for these refrigerants and these different kinds of fluorinated compounds. Anytime there's a new chemistry that appears on the market, somebody needs the Henry's Law Constant, so mix it in water, mix it in acetone, mix it in benzene, toluene, every kind of solvent on the shelf, and you just turn that crank and put the papers out. So that position is open. <laughs> <laughs> somebody could dive in. Yeah. Um, but it's, you know, eventually... After I never liked that because it wasn't variety enough. Yeah, I'd be like, ah, sure. oh, you know, just doing the same this. thing over and over again, you know. But anyway, it's tempting. It's always tempting to find something that's going to be that productive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we always joke about the organic chemists. They have a, their parent molecule and they do one bromo, two bromo, three bromo. <laughs> <laughs> they just move it around and do the different chemistry of it. And it's, you know, it's good work if you can get it. Yeah. <clears throat> so these are the equations. So you, instead of the pure... Vapor pressure, you have the Henry's Law constant. And so you're always comparing these two to know, 
you know, if it's real or ideal, oh yeah, you know, if it's an ideal solution or not. So if these are very close together, then the, the mixture behaves nicely. If they're far apart, the mixture is crazy bad you know, or you know, non-ideal. And so if you think about this, this, this Henry's Law constant can be really big. Here's the vapor pressure. It can be huge. If this slope where the dilute solution takes off, we just extrapolate it all the way across the plot and where it hits the, the, you know, the other side, then the Henry's Law constant, it has pressure units, but it really isn't anything physical. You know, it's not a, there's nothing physical over there. It's just how the solute behaves in that dilute solution. Some of these can be, you know, if you've got a vapor pressure, well, let's look at it um, for, the, for the acetone and carbon disulfide. So here's carbon disulfide. So here's, you know, we're in the hundreds of, of tor, but where do you think this line, look at the steep slope, where do you think that line hits? You know, as it goes off, you know, it's past the third floor on this axis. And so this could be 100,000 tor or something like that. Yeah, the number is really irrelevant because you're never going to, it's not going to apply over on that side, but it's still the slope of that line. The x-axis, rise over run, right? The run is 1, 0 to 1. And so this Henry's Law constant is the slope of that line, and that slope can be 10,000 tor. So it can be huge. We, we could also have the other situation. Look at the, look at the mixture on the right. The mole fraction of chloroform on the x-axis, and the solute in this case is uh, acetone. So acetone and chloroform mixing together. And then this vapor pressure of the mixture is less than the Dalton's Law vapor pressure. <laughs> so they really like each other. They really like each other. That's the take-home lesson. And so to think about chloroform. So do you know? Do you remember the, the structure for chloroform? Okay, it's a common name. So. Yeah. So there's chloroform. Okay. Do, do chlorine atoms hydrogen bond typically? No. And so this molecule really can't hydrogen bond with itself. It is polar, so it does like itself. But in an acetone. The methyl groups hydrogen bond? Not really. I mean, it's just measurable, but it's not, not really a hydrogen bond. I think nitrogen and oxygen and fluorine do the hydrogen bonding uh, with hydrogen. So this one really doesn't hydrogen bond with itself. But what if you mix the two? Yeah, that would be Woo! We got partners. We got hydrogen bonding to carbonyl. And so the mixture has an interaction that the pure solvents don't have. And so naturally, they like to be in the solution, their vapor pressure drops. So this is a non-ideal solution as well. But if you got this, and this is the sweet spot here, you know, that's the minimum vapor pressure. And so these Henry's Law constants would be less than the vapor pressure. So if you extrapolate this Henry's Law constant over here, this would be K for chloroform. And here's P star for chloroform. And so you can compare those numbers and say, oh, that's interesting. Just by looking at Henry's Law versus the vapor pressure, you don't even need the curve. If you're in a table and you go, oh, Henry's Law constant, compare it to the vapor pressure, it's less than. That means this mixture is happy. You know, those molecules like each other. And so that's fantastic. Also, you should be able to measure the heat given off by mixing these two. Because when they form those hydrogen bonds, energy's got to go somewhere and it's going to be given off in heat. And so that's what we're doing in the lab with this infrared camera. We're filming mixtures of solutions and we're seeing delta H of mixing and we get a heat signature. So we take the pipette, a micro pipette and a regular pipette. We put solvent A in one pipette, put solvent B in the other, stick them together and then slowly squeeze the plunger. And the solution goes into the other and we have the infrared camera going and you see this heat bloom. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's also cool to see the, leak, the solution that leaks out evaporates, and that cools things down. So before you mix it, you start to see everything get really cold from evaporative cooling. And then you mix them together, and you see this bright light come out. So 
that's going to be at the undergraduate research symposium with Ashlyn and Shannon and uh, Diana. So they're going to be giving a talk on that. So if you go to the URS, be sure to go by and see their talk looking at chemical mixing and reaction with new eyes. Okay, so let's do a kahoot and we'll be done. Hello. <laughs> over this too. Yeah. I gotta win it something. <laughs> All right. You gotta enjoy the little things. <laughs> see the diagram. What's the vapor pressure of substance A? You gotta read that chart. So here's XA. So this is one, that's two. Might be a little difficult to see. Pressure of substance B at this temperature of this space bag. <laughs> Very good. Okay, what's the mole ratio of a solution of A and B that boils at the temperature of this phase diagram? What's the mole ratio of solution of A and B that boils at the temperature of this phase diagram? Questions on that? Like yeah, so you find boiling. So we've got one atmosphere here. You come across. They would this this temperature. These are all at the same temperature, okay? Yeah. But if you picked a pressure like room, like one atmosphere pressure, then this solution of this composition boils at whatever temperature this diagram is at is boiling right here, and that's about thirty three percent A. <coughs> Okay, what substance has the highest boiling point? Take your time. <laughs> Everybody hates answers, questions with just two answers, right? I don't know why, but like true false, people are like, ah, oh, I can't do true false. Multiple choices, just five true falses. All right, so explaining that just briefly. It says the lowest vapor pressure, and so I've got to heat it up to get it to boil more. This one's already above one atmosphere. I'd have to cool it down. So I know this low, least volatile substance has a higher boiling point. Okay, almost done. No, no laughs, I guess. Come on, no fans of Jennifer Lawrence? Come on. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't get it. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> 
Peter Millark. Okay. Oh, good. I know my place. All right. Good job. <laughs> nice, nice. Okay. All right, y'all have a great spring break. Oh, okay.